have your Bibles, let's go straight to the scripture and look at some places. We're going to be actually in Acts. We're going to read two places out of Acts. So let's look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 4, verse 5. And that's where we're going to meet one of our characters. His name is Saul. So Acts chapter 9. So glad to see everyone here. Smiley faces, beautiful faces. The future of our church, the future of God's church, the future of God's movement is here. Yes. So do you guys know that you will carry, continue to carry the torch in Jesus' name? So uh, as we read chapter 9, verse Four, I think it starts. So, and he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, Jesus, who, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goat. No, the goats. Uh, some of you are reading the Bible, it, that place is missing. It, is, it appears again as some scripture, I mean, some Bible translations have that. It is difficult for you to kick against the goats. Some don't. Uh, but it, is, it does appear again in chapter 26 as Paul preaching and uh, giving a testimony as he recalls what happened. He does say that in every translation. And so that's why they put it in here in some translations. But it is what happened is that's what Jesus said, said to him. And th it was a metaphor that everybody knew. A metaphor that it is difficult to kick or go against the goats. And the goat it was like, um, you know, when an ox, a pair of ox were pulling uh, and the goat or another name for it that we can find is a prick. A prick, not like a guy prick, but a prick is something that you would uh, push in the ground. And as the oxen pulled, it would uh, basically plow. There you go. It's like a plow. So what? What? Old words. Yeah, old school words. So what happened is when an oxen, what, what, what uh, Jesus was saying or the analogy or metaphor that is used in there, everybody understood it at the time is like, the more you pull, the deeper the goad or the plow goes into the ground. So it's like you're working against yourself. And that's what Jesus was saying. So we have a story of Saul, a man who, has, who is very zealous, right? Zealous for, uh, for God, for the things of God, even though at the same time he's a murderer of Christians. But he thought he's doing it for Jesus. I mean, not for Jesus. He was doing it for God, the God that he believed. And then there's another man, and his name is Peter. And we read in, uh, about Peter a little bit. But the scripture, so we're going to talk about those two guys. But uh, let's look at Acts chapter 2. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. The day of Pentecost come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent of rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So here, one of the main personas in that gathering in the upper room on the day of Pentecost was who? Was Peter. Peter, he was the guy who... After they were accusing the men, they're speaking all these different languages and speaking in tongues. They must be drunk. He's the one who got up and he spoke. And remember, he spoke and he said, you are the ones that killed Jesus. He, he called those people murderers. And you know what? They repented. 3,000 of them. It was the first harvest of the church. By the way... Pentecost or the harvest or the, uh, yeah, the, it's the holiday or the feast of weeks was actually a feast of first harvest. So it was the feast or the 
first harvest of the church. And it wasn't, my friends, a coincidence. What it was is God had a plan. God had a plan and he had an end game in mind. And when he had an end game in mind of the Pentecost, of the church, and the things that were done before, he did it with a purpose. So my first point is that God has a plan and he works according to his plan. You know, we just had that um, holiday that we had, and that's the day of Pentecost, or uh, in Ukrainian or Russian, it's called Tritsa. Those that understand, those that don't, that's fine. But they have Pentecost. And as I was reading uh, this chapter 2, it, it some down on me. Some down on me. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had come. And it occurred to me that it's actually a big deal. God had a plan. My friends, this day of the, the coming down of the Holy Spirit, the pouring out of the promise of God would not have come the day before or day after. It came on the day of Pentecost because God planned it that way. You, you have to understand, God has a plan. He has a master plan. And he is moving according to that plan. You know, sometimes when we look at the scriptures or as we study the scriptures, we go, okay, so... On the day of Pentecost, you know, 2,000 years before, on Mount Sinai, God gave the law. And now he gave the power to fulfill that law. Whoa, what a coincidence. Well, that's just cool. We might think that way, but the, the bigger point is, is that God planned it that way. And when he told them to have, to celebrate a feast of weeks, or uh, the reason it was called the, uh, the feast of weeks is because seven weeks after the, the Passover, after seven weeks, after 49 days, on the 50th day, you were supposed to celebrate. When he told them that thousands of years before, he was planning on that day, and he saw his disciples, he saw his disciples, and he saw the people he was going to, fulfilled that promise to, and he did it on that day. So it's just so important. God has a plan. Fast forward to today. I want to tell you, God still is moving according to his plan. He is. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. He has a plan for this church. He has a plan on your life. He's like a master planner. And he built according to his plan. Can you imagine coming to a construction site? You know, there's a lot of construction going on in Bellevue, downtown Seattle, even here in Tequila. Did you guys know? I read some today, some weird. I looked up the most dangerous city. I wanted to see what's the most dangerous city in the world. Tequila, Washington is number one in the United States. That is crazy. It is per capita. But it's number one. I was like, wow, no wonder. I keep telling my wife, you cannot go to the South Center Mall. No matter what. It's dangerous. I mean, people get shot and mugged. And, but anyway. So, uh... If you pray, God will protect you, you know. <laughs> so, can you imagine? So, there's, I don't know if you guys noticed, but across from the mall, there's a building going up. I think it's like 15 stories high. It's going to be a cool building. I, for some reason, I always get excited about tall buildings. When I, there's another tall building, I'm like, woohoo. So, can you imagine? You're a subcontractor. You're showing up to a construction site. You take one of those elevators, you know, the construction elevators. You all seen construction elevator? You go up that construction elevator. You come up to like fourth floor and you look from the construction elevator. And you're like, that's a good view. That's Mount Rainier right there. I'm going to build me here my condo and put a kitchen. And you start installing your kitchen. And the building is like, you know, still everything open. But you're, you're like doing your own project. Can you imagine that? The foreman will come up and say... Something wrong with you? What you been smoking? What is wrong with you? Get out of here. 
Because those of you that are, you know, ever been involved with construction, everything is not by a coincidence. Everything is by the plan. You know, everything is by the plan. So there's a plan. First goes foundation, then goes, you know, the, the floors. Then they put, you know, usually the elevator shaft goes in first. Then you got the electricity. Then you got the insulation. Then you get the flooring and all of those. But it, it's all according to the plan and everybody know what they got to do. Can you imagine God of universe who created Everything that we see and the things that we don't see, you know, are the smallest cells in our body contains a DNA that has so much data that they cannot even comprehend and, and I mean billions of codes of data. He created everything. He planned everything out. But somehow about your life, about this church, about this life or about his church is just, you know, coincidences. I don't think so. Do you see the point? God has a plan. If people can plan, believe me, God can plan and he already planned. And that's why it's so significant, so significant that on the day of Pentecost, because it was the day that was foreseen and promised by God and it wouldn't have happened before or after. On that day and in that place and so the question is only where is Paul or Saul we're not talking about Paul we're talking Saul before the conversion where is Saul and where is Peter Saul is persecuting the Christians and Peter is obeying the word of God because what did God told him do not depart from Jerusalem until you receive the power that is promised. Peter obeys the word of God and what happens? He is in a place where amazing things are happening. First message, 3,000 people come to God and it's the first harvest. Saul, on the other hand, he is building a kitchen on the fourth floor of some building. And he's only building it until the foreman comes. Do you know when the foreman showed up? When Saul was on the way to Damascus with a letter in his hand to persecute more Christians. And the foreman of the project, who is JC, shows up and says, Paul or Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? I think a lot of times in our lives, we wonder, Lord, who are you? Where are you? I have the zeal. I have the desire. But all these projects, they're so hard to, to complete, to push. Where are you, Lord? Who are you? Where are you in my life? Who are you in my life? What voice are you? And then he says, it's difficult for you to push against the goad it's not the goat it's a goad it's like a plow it's not going anywhere i read somewhere that in chapter four of acts where they talk about barnabas that was one of his best friends that barnabas turned to jesus and became christian and that hurt paul and then you remember he was he, was, he thought he had a victory when, he, when they were stoning Stephen and he was looking, but yet Stephen, his face looked there, like the, the face of an angel and, and he was screaming out before dying, forgive them because they don't know. And the more he thought he was persevering, the harder it became for Paul. The, the more he pushed in, the, the, the harder it became. 
But the question is, or, or the statement of this first point is that God, my friends, he has a plan. He has a plan. And are you like Peter or are you like Saul? Are you obeying the word of God and you're in his plan? Or are you like Saul and you're going against his plan and doing your own thing? So in order, my friends, to be right there, to be part of God's plan, you have to listen to the word of God. You have to be in the house of God. Notice, Peter was in the house of God. In the house of God when God's plan was revealed. It's not a coincidence. Question for you. If Peter was not there when the Pentecost happened, would it happen? Yeah. That's right. Would the first harvest happen? My friends, God has a plan and he will get it done. Why? Because he's the get it done kind of person. He's get it done. If, remember, remember what, uh, what Jesus said? If they, if they be quiet, the rocks will cry out. God will raise up rocks. God will do what he planned. He has a building in mind. He has new Jerusalem. He has his church in mind. And you know what? He will build that church regardless whether we're in or we're out. But you know what? He really wants us to be in. And that's why he told Peter, listen, Peter, some amazing going to be happening. Amazing movement. Don't we all want a movement? I tell you, I want a movement. I'm all about the movement. I don't want to sit. I don't want to sleep. I want to move. And he said, there is going to be a movement, but you got to be there. You can't be going out on your own and be some subcontractor. Doing your own thing. Building your own little kingdom. And that's really what the point of this message is. Do you want to see the hand of God? Do you want to see the great things of God? Do you want to move with God or do you want to struggle? If you want to move with God, be like Peter. If you want to struggle... Be like Paul. Do your own thing. But if you want to be like Peter, if you want to be in the movement of God, see the great things. Be like Peter. Be like Peter. Point number two, are you in obedience or are you kicking against the grain? Are you kicking against the wind? Following God's plan. If you're following God's plan, it's easy. I'm not saying it won't be without difficulty, but it'll be easy. But in order to fall into God's plan and be part of it, you know, there'll be great success because the building will get complete, okay? So you need to be led by the Spirit. It's, it's a whole new topic on how to be led by the Spirit. But you've heard tons of messages here. And I believe you know somewhat. But point number one, you have to be led by the Spirit in order to be part of the plan of God. You have to have peace from God within. You know, I'm talking about... You know that you're part of God's plan when you have peace, even when it's difficult. But if you don't have peace, then you know you're not doing things according to the will of God. Let me tell you what kind of peace I'm talking about. You know, like if there is a church on Sunday and you're sitting home watching TV, you probably don't have peace. You don't have peace because you know you got to be elsewhere. 
Because God is doing some according to his plan and you're not there. That's no peace. And when you're in church, you have peace. And if some of you are going, boy, I have perfect peace. Let me tell you, bro, <laughs> or sister, I need to repent. But I believe I'm talking to the people of God that love God. But even though you love God, there's still a choice to be made. Am I going to be like Peter or am I going to be like Saul? Am I going to have use my zeal and my energy to do my own thing? Or am I going to seek and be part of the greater plan? Okay. So got to be led by the spirit. Got to have peace from God. And do you see God confirming the things that you're doing? Because when you're doing things according to the plan of God, then God will confirm those things. Jesus is not going to show up or somebody's not going to show up and say, what in the world are you doing? It makes no sense. No. When Jesus shows up and you're doing the right thing, what? When Peter was doing the right thing, when he was, accord when he was in the right place, according to God's plan because he listened to the word of God, Oh, 3,000 people repented. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's pretty good. I'd say that's a confirmation. Would you? That's a confirmation. People coming to God, that's a confirmation. People being healed, that's a confirmation. People being delivered from drugs, that's a confirmation. People cursing God, probably doing something wrong. You know, God gives us a hard desire. He, he places the way, when he creates us, when, when he molds us, something happens in us and he, we, we have these hard desires. And Psalm 37, 4 says, when you delight in the Lord, he will give you your hard desire. Well, Paul, or when we'll, I'm sorry, keep, I need to say Saul. When Saul his hard desire was to glorify God. He was very zealous. Do you guys know what zealous means? Excited or, or you know, uh, passionate. passionate. That's right. Uh, some more words. Uh, up for God. Just total, all about religion of his fathers. He wanted to prove that it's right. He wanted to expand it. But, so that was his heart's desire. But the thing is, he was, he was doing it himself. He was trying to get it done himself. Well, did you notice what the scripture says? When you delight in the Lord, when you become a part of a plan of God, what's going to happen is you don't need to come and grab him or come and, and fulfill or create the circumstance for your heart desire, what's going to happen is one day, Holy Spirit will just hand you your heart desires. Because that's what the God says. That's what the scripture says. When you delight in the Lord, God will give you your heart desires. You will receive them in your hands. You will see them in your life and you'll be like, wow, I did not even expect it. But all of a sudden, the things I dreamed when I was a kid, they're happening in my life. And you don't have to fight for them. Because when you're part of the plan of God, it happens. Because he's perfect God and he has a perfect plan. And those hard desires that he placed very deep into you, he has a plan to use them so that it'll be, you'll be used for his purpose and your fulfillment. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome. When you obey God, he gives you the desires of your heart. If you're an independent contractor, you end up going deeper as you try harder. And it's really hard to get out. Now, it's important to mention here that being part of the plan of God, I'm not saying that there won't be any hardships. The hardships will come. Life 
is not easy for anybody. We all have hardships. But something interesting I heard today that if you're, try, if you're trying to climb a steep mountain, if there is no rocks, there's no way to climb. You need rocks. You need difficulties. But then you get to the mountaintop. But there's huge difference between Saul's difficulties and Peter's difficulties. Saul's difficulties are failure after failure and disappointment after disappointment and feeling of guilt. If you find yourself in this position, I'm telling you, if you get those feelings, even though you might be doing things for God, you might not be doing them according to his plan and you should repent. Let go of your pride. Peter had difficulties too. I mean, he is like a couple weeks after Pentecost, he's locked up in jail for healing somebody. And he knows that his head is going to come off because just earlier, his brother James, they took off his head. The first apostle to die for Christ was James and that was Peter's brother. And he knew his time has come. It was like Christina sitting in that office knowing that hey there's a manager and there is HR and my head is on the chopping block bam she's like whatever God must have a promotion for me somewhere else there is gonna be difficulties but look at Peter's difficulty it's difficulty he is in jail but there's a victory Difficulties when you are in the plan of God and you're moving according to his plan. There will be difficulties, even like jail. But it'll either lead you to elevation in the spirit or a complete victory. And that's the promise and that's the whole Bible. That's the whole Bible. Every trial leads to a triumph. And you know what? And he was also peaceful in jail. He was just sleeping. And when Paul, when he learned his lesson, how to listen to Jesus, what did he do? When he was in jail, he was just singing with, uh, with Silas. Finally, the final point is when we read about Saul, we go back to chapter 9. We read this, verse 6, Jesus said, but get up and enter the city and it'll be told to you what you must do. Get up, I'm telling you here right now, get up, go, and it'll be told to you what you must do. No self-contractors. In God's kingdom. No making your own plan. I know it might sound a little bit rough. But I guarantee you. I, I just guarantee you. God's plan. Is the most amazing plan. We might think we know. We might think you know. I've already lived like. 14 years. I know everything. God's. <laughs> Alberto, Alberto got the joke. God has the most amazing plan and your life in it is the best life you can live. Trust him. But the thing is, you will be told what to do. Do you want to be like Peter? You will be told what to do. Are you ready for that? This generation, like every generation, you know what the devil wants to say? The norm is rebellion. Are you ready to be told what to do? Are you ready to be told what to do? By the Holy Spirit? By God? 
You will not know how to do it yourself. I don't and you won't. We need the leading of the Spirit and that's why Jesus told Paul, Saul, get up and go and you will be told what to do. Are you ready to listen? Are you ready to obey? You'll be told what to do by Spirit of God, by the circumstances God puts in your life, by the ministers of God. Remember Ananias? God said to Ananias, go and place your hands and heal him and tell him. By God's word. And the thing is, when you are told what to do, he says you must do it. You must do it. Regardless of the cost. You know, so many people missed out on being just in this move of God. The things that our desires are made of. We, we, we desire that, but then something happens and we don't want to pay the cost. You must do it. If God places you in his plan, in his kingdom, and you have to in that building, you need to place the tiles. You need to place the tiles because kitchen is coming in next. It cannot be skipped, so you must do it. You will be told what to do, but you must do it. You want to be like Peter, you must do it. No matter what it costs. And it costs. Sometimes it's so difficult. I, I think back when the ministry was starting and we had one of the young ladies that wanted to preach. And you know what? Every time it was her time to preach, she'd get sick. Every time. Some of you out here, you're like, man, every time I want to preach or every time I want to do something that I committed to, it's like the whole hell breaks loose. Well, welcome to the club. Welcome. I've been preaching for 15 years and it doesn't end or 20 years and it doesn't end. The enemy attacks and there's a price to pay. But you must do it. If you are part of the plan of God, God and the church is waiting on you. You must do it because it, the next step cannot happen. Don't you understand? Do it. And I'm passionate about this generation. Because it is up to you. Your turn has come and you must do it. God will tell you what to do, but you must do it. And do it. And then when you do it, let us stand as we come to a close. When you do it, I just want to remind you that being part of the plan of God, what's going to happen is as you're busy following these orders that are coming from heaven through all kinds of different directions. I'm not saying you're going to be going all kinds of different directions. The orders are coming from heaven through the spirit of God through the voice in your, in your heart, through pastors, through circumstances, as you're busy doing that, and as you are persevering in making it happen, just like you do it with homework. Who does homework like automatically happens? No, you, you have to persevere. You have to sometimes stay late and stay late, all, da, 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 all of that. But if you do that dedication to the word of God and you do it what's gonna happen is one day you're busy or doing all of that and you find yourself in the midst of the movement of God and those deep heart desires that you almost forgot and maybe gave up on and you're like you know why do I even have those thoughts why did I even think of those things you'll see them happening in your life why because God foresaw that day. God foresaw you. God saw the day of Pentecost. God saw your day. God saw your talents, your gift and your desires. And everything that he was, has been planning, you were part of his plan.